one. The open meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Therefore, please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications. And now I hand it over to Kyle. Good evening. Thank you, Jessica. My name is Kyle Robidoux. I'm a member of the commission and I'd like to welcome everyone to the August meeting of the City of Boston's Disability Commission. We'd like to first start with introductions and if I can begin on my far right with the commissioner. Good evening. I'm Krista McCosh, the Disability Commissioner and ADA Title II Coordinator for the City of Boston. I am Jerry Boyd. I'm a resident of West Roxbury. Felicia Battles Birdsong, resident of Dorchester. Eugene Gloss, resident of uh, High Park. Dusty Lebovskaya, resident of uh, Boston. Zaria Mirosaini, resident of Boston. Excellent, thank you. And thank you for those in the audience for attending the meeting. So we're gonna start with first the approval of the July minutes. Do we hear a motion to approve the minutes? I move. Excellent, thank you, Jerry. And a second? I second. Yeah. All right, we will take multiple seconds. So minutes for the July meeting are approved. So we are going to begin tonight's meeting with a presentation about Markin, uh, Martins Park and we have some representatives here from the Department of Parks and Recreation. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and then take it from there. Hi everybody, my name is Lauren Bryant and I'm a project manager with the Parks and Recreation Department um, and I'm the project manager for Martins Park. So first of all, thank you guys for letting me come talk about accessibility and inclusion in parks. It's something that's near and dear to my heart and something that um, luckily our uh, parks commissioner is excited about too. So he kind of lets me run with a lot of things trying to push that in the parks even further than we've done in the past, which is really exciting. Um, so just a quick um, heads up, my job as project manager, I'm in the design and construction unit. So I do everything from when we're starting to look at the budgets for future years, help identify which parks are gonna go into the budget. I work with um, hiring designers for individual projects, work with the designer and the community to figure out what the, pro what the park actually needs and go through the design process. I follow it through bidding and then I also do all of the construction oversight to make sure it's built correctly. Um, so for me, really getting into accessibility and inclusion as part of that design process is huge and pushing that to make sure that we can really bring more of that into the parks. Um, I'm currently working on 12 park projects and I know that I'm here to talk to you guys about Martins Park, but just as a heads up for you guys, there are five of us who do what I do. So if you think about that, we've got quite a few projects that we're working on every year and each of those projects we're trying to look at accessibility as part of the design and increasing that and improving that as we do all of our park projects. Um, so Martins Park, which I know is what I'm here to talk to you guys about. Um, for those of you who may not know, um, Martins Park is gonna be a brand new waterfront park um, along the Fort Point Channel directly adjacent to the Children's Museum. Um, it's going to be in memory of Martin Richard, who was the youngest victim of the marathon bombing. The Richard family has been involved with us since day one. And from the very first day when we met with them about what the goals of this park were, accessibility and inclusion were their number one priority. Um, in addition to that, they wanted it to be a place where kids' imaginations can grow and where children can just be kids and enjoy themselves and not have to think about um, why we have that park. So they want us to remember the victims, but for it to not be quite as obvious so that that's what people think about every time they're there. They want people to enjoy it and have a very peaceful um, time in that park. Um, they also really want it to feel like nature. There are a lot of kids in the city of Boston that don't get out into nature. And we're in such an urban environment that really bringing in nature into the park was another one of their goals that they really wanted us to have. So. One of the, so the other thing that uh, is kind of challenging about this site, not only do we have a lot of these goals from the Richard family to, um, to get into the park, but it's a really urban environment that has a lot of needs from the community. One of the major needs, if you look at the, the park plan that I showed, the main pathway that cuts through is a huge pedestrian circulation between Seaport Boulevard and that neighborhood and the Harbor Walk. And so making sure that stays open is a huge part of the project. What we also wanted was for the park to not feel as if a lot of strangers were walking through the park. 
as a parent, I know it's something that when you're in a playground, it's kind of a strange thing to have people walk through the park. So we want people to feel comfortable commuting, but we want parents to also feel comfortable when they're in the park. So it got a, a big dilemma as to how can we combine all of these things together. So one of the things that we did is we actually raised the grades and changed the elevation. And at first that seems like that would be really kind of anti-accessibility, but what we found is that raising the grades actually allows us to get children and caregivers, especially in wheelchairs, up to the level that other people are playing at. It gets you to the top of slides. It gets you to the deck of our boat. Um, so at first it might seem kind of contradictory, but to us we've actually found that that helps quite a bit in the design process. So one of the things that we did is we created these two distinct sides that allowed pedestrians to still move through. Each side is a little bit different. One side that has the boat is more dramatic play. It's more um, imaginative play. The other side has climbers. It's got slides that you can get to in wheelchairs. It's got um, log mazes that even children in wheelchairs can roll through and find their way through these, this maze. Um, and that's kind of the more active side versus the more dramatic play side. Um, and so then what we said is how do we connect these two sides? Because we need to have the pedestrian circulation to go through. So that raising the grade allows us to actually create two ramps that go around the park and end up at about 16 feet above grade where we have a pedestrian bridge that cuts across. So children can stay in this imaginative world and can still, everybody can still get through both sides of the playground and you still have the pedestrian crossing that goes through. So that solved a lot of problems for us. Um, let's see, make sure I can talk through all the points. It's such a great park that I have so many things I want to tell you guys. Um, so the major item and the major element in the park is this play ship. So if you actually look at one of the next pages, two pages down, that's actually not our play ship, but it's one that was made by the same manufacturer. Do you need one? Yes, I do. So the play ship is manufactured by the same company as the one that made this one. Big difference on this one, if you can tell, nobody that's in a wheelchair can get to the top of that deck. And that's just not okay for us. So one of the things that we did, again, with that ramping of the slopes, were actually, if you can imagine, that, and it's not sand either, this one is sand, ours is gonna be rubber surfacing. So if you look and imagine the front of this boat, but that grade behind it slopes up. So there's rubber surfacing that, that ro ramps up, it's supposed to almost look like a wave, so that the boat is floating in this wave. But there's a pathway that goes all the way around the outside where it says accessible path that gets up to the top of that play ship. So kids in wheelchairs can get onto the deck of that ship. On that ship, there's gonna be a lot of things kids can play with, their ropes, their telescopes. They're all the fun things that you wanna play with on the boat. We've got lots of them at a lot of different heights and elevations. So the children there are standing, somebody that might have transferred onto something, all these different heights and elevations so that kids can all play together, and they're not separated. It's not, this is the accessible side and this isn't. Everything is together and it's integrated so that everybody is using it the same way. You'll also see there isn't a shortcut path. These pathways, the accessible pathways that go around, that's the pathway. It's not the accessible pathway, it's the pathway, it's the route to get up there, and that's what we wanted it to be. Everybody plays together. Um, the other thing along these pathways, we wanted them to be kind of fun in themselves. So along those pathways, there are things for kids to discover. There are drums, there are wind chimes, there are a lot of auditory things for kids to use, creating their own music. There are small animal sculptures that are supposed to be for touch and sensory. So you know you can roll up to it, you can walk up to it, you can kind of like hike around the back side of it, and you can touch it, you can feel it, figure out which animal it is. We have different animals that are in different regions based on the design. So maybe there's a seal by the boat, um, maybe there's a snail or a turtle over by the water play. So we tried to incorporate a lot of um, different things that kids could find along the way. So on the, the page um, right above where the boat is, one of the other things that's really key over in the dramatic play area is the water play. And we debated a lot during the design, and I think I even talked to the commissioner um, and several you know, parents with of kids with disabilities to say, you know, what do you guys think about sand play versus water play? And we went back and forth a lot. Like, we could try to make the most accessible sand play that we could, but it still wouldn't be that everybody could use it. 
So we looked at water play and we thought, you know, that's fantastic, it's much more accessible. But what it also does is for anyone who has temperature regulation issues, it actually cools the entire area that that's in because it's going to be heavily vegetated around it. And so we were thinking that in addition to the fact that it's more accessible for the actual play itself, it provides another benefit for the park as well. Um, we have dish swing, um, which for those of you who may not know, um, it just some people just think it's a regular swing. But one of the great things about it is that it, um, from a sensory, especially sensory disorder perspective, it does a lot with the swinging and kind of the rocking motion. Um, it also is fantastic for children on the autism spectrum because it almost feels like a little nest. They have their own little cocoon and they can feel really comfortable in that space. But it's also really good for kids working together. And so you can get four or five kids on there. You can get a, a caregiver and a child. I know I've spent a lot of time on there with my kids. Um, so that's a really fantastic thing to incorporate into the park as well. And then again, um, one of the things I was talking about earlier is the, um, the, like the, the log maze. So you'll see there's kind of an image again made by the same company that is making the one for us. But ours is actually um, spaced differently so that kids can run through, children in wheelchairs can run through and move through. Um, so that's part of the design as well, is trying to look at some things that have been done in the past but change them so that they can meet the goals that we have for this project. Um, the next page has some um, sl embankment slides, and it's one of the things that um, the, the Richard family was very excited about, was having a place that children could really test their abilities. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that children who were in wheelchairs could also use this space. So again, you get to the top of these slides by going around our accessible pathway so that, that caregivers and children can get to the top of these slides. And one of the other things we've been trying to incorporate into this park, small details that we hear from members of the disability community who've said, I never see this at a park or I wish this were there. Um, I have a friend who um, has a daughter in a wheelchair and one of the things she said to me is, I love that you guys are designing all these embankment slides and all of these um, ramps that we can get to the top of the slide. But then I go down with my daughter, and where do I put her? I have nowhere to put her when I go back up to get her wheelchair. And because they're accessible ramps, they're usually decently long, as we all know. So to get back up there and get back down with the wheelchair takes a little bit of time. So what does she do with her daughter? And so she said, you know, she always has the, the problem of, I set her on the ground to try to make sure she's out of the route of traffic because she's she has quadriplegia she can't move herself um so wh what do we do and so she said you know putting in seating at the base of a slide would really help people like us who just need somewhere safe to put our child while we go retrieve the wheelchair so there are a lot of small details like that that we're putting into this um this park that i think are going to make it really neat and unique we're also trying to along the way put um signage so that we talk about what the plants are, what the smells are that people smell, what some of the textures are that they see on the trees, um, even if they're ones that you can't get to, but just to talk about all of those seasonal changes, to talk about the inclusive components that we have in the park. So we're gonna have signage that actually talks about it because what we found in the parks department is educating people about it um, is fantastic. We can put in all the things we want in the world, but let's say no one's going to know that we put that bench there special, that we made a thoughtful decision about that. So putting in some signs that talk about all the inclusive things we're doing in the park is going to be huge. Um, then one of the other things that we kind of piloted on this project that I'm hoping that we may be able to do with a lot of our others are the next three pages, which is an inclusive um, play kind of scorecard as we were calling it. And we were using um, PlayCore's five elements of inclusive design, which are physical, social, cognitive, communication, and sensory. So what we asked our designers to do is really think about this park um, not necessarily as just ADA, because we want to go above ADA. We want to make this for everybody. And I think for a lot of designers, and I put myself in that category, um, designing a park with ADA in mind is very easy. There's a guideline, there are regulations. It's, it's very easy to make sure we check all those boxes. Um, but when it comes to sensory things, when it comes to other types of disabilities, it's not always quite as easy to make sure that we're hitting all of those marks. So we wanna make sure that we do that and we wanna make sure that we continue to add to that. So if there's anybody in the room that has other ideas, I'm always happy to listen, feel free to reach out. Um, so I'm not gonna go through this entire inclusion scorecard for you. And this is actually an older version because they're working on updating the um, inclusion scorecard right now because we've had a few design changes since this was done. 
but we had them actually look at every single element in the park, whether it be seating, drinking fountains, swings, play elements, the, the nature play, the planting, and say, how does this meet those elements that we want to have? And so they went through, and it was really eye-opening for us to be able to go through at the beginning of the project and then go through at the end and make sure we were still meeting those goals that we had for the project. So that, um, that really, in a nutshell, is Martin's Park. Um, it's a very exciting project. We actually, um, you guys may have seen, uh, about two or three weeks ago, we had a groundbreaking ceremony. The mayor and the governor were both there. Um, if you guys did not see Jane Richards' comments and her speech, I would highly recommend Googling it and listening to it. It was inspiring and it made me cry. Um, she really talks about why we're doing this park and why it's so important, and I would highly recommend it if you haven't um, heard that. And also, just to let everybody know, um, the, even though we had the groundbreaking ceremony, construction fencing is actually going up this weekend, and we should be fully active construction starting next week. And it's gonna be about a year to a year and a month of the project. Um, the other thing that I just wanna make sure I give shout out to everybody that was very helpful with us, because we've had a lot, of, um, a lot of support from other state and city agencies. So the MBTA actually gave us the property that the park is going on. It was an MBTA property, so they're giving that to us. Um, we also have public works parcel that was transferred to the Parks Department. When we started this, the Parks Department didn't own any of it. Um, the Children's Museum has been an amazing partner, and they actually have a parking parcel that they, current, that they own that they're actually giving us air rights to. So what we're actually doing is when I was talking about raising the grade and changing the elevation of the park, we're actually going to build almost like a little semi-enclosed garage over their parking. We're warping the park over the top of that, and that's actually how we're getting the height to go up and over that bridge, and it's expanding the square footage of the park. So on top of their building is actually going to be the dish swing and the log maze that we have. Those things are actually on top of their building, including the access to those slides. So the embankment slides underground is actually going from the top of their parking garage off into the park. Um, but you'll never see that from above when you're in the park. So they've been a pretty amazing partner to give us that and all the easements to be able to build the park. Um, we've worked, like I said, we, we've met with the Disabilities Commission. We've worked with Fort Point Landmark Historic District Association. So we've been working with all of these different organizations to get to where we are. Um, and I just wanted to say thanks to all of them. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to do in the last few pages, um, I just want to make sure everybody doesn't think that we're only paying this much attention to Martin's Park because of what it is. Um, the Parks Department, like I said, we've got quite a few projects going on at once, and I just was going to highlight a few that we've done recently. Um, Children's Park in Roxbury just opened about a month ago. Um, it was a small parcel that we heard from the community when we started that there were a lot of accessibility needs. There were a lot of children in the community with autism. The Leela Frederick School is directly behind it, the field actually for the school and the back of our playground, the parcels abutted, but there was a major retaining wall. They couldn't get there. They couldn't go all the way around the block because the grades were too much. So it's an inclusion school that their kids couldn't get here. They fundraised to take, it breaks my heart, they, they fundraised to take one field trip a year to Menino Park for the kids to play for one day. Mm -hmm. So what I said is, you know, this isn't okay. So I went on their field trip with them to Menino Park. I got to see which pieces of equipment they loved, which ones they could all use. Because um, some of them they couldn't all use, depending on you know the size of their wheelchair, anything else. So there was one piece of equipment that was the accessible carousel, which is the main picture on the Children's Park page, that they all could use. And that was, I said, we're getting that piece of equipment here. We ended up getting um, an additional donor, gave us $100,000 from the High Highland Street Foundation so that we could make sure that we could get some of these pieces of equipment that weren't originally in that budget because we weren't, we didn't realize that this was such a need at this park when we first started. Um, and so D&D &D had an abandoned building on the parcel next door. They tore it down, gave us the property. We doubled the size of the park. Um, but then we had a 20-foot grade change across the site, which is pretty significant for any park, especially when we're trying to make it accessible. But we did it. We put ramps in. We now have four accessible entrances to the park. We've got accessible seating. The kids can actually have an outdoor classroom there now because we have so many table and chair combinations that are accessible. They've got their carousel. They've got a piece of play equipment that has a ramp to actually get onto the structure because, again, we raised the grade and made a ramp that went around. We've got embankment slides, roller slides. We've got all of these things that the kids can use. Um, 
for Hardeman basketball court. It was just one of our various courts, court repair projects. And when I went there, I said, this doesn't make any sense. We've got stairs that go down into the court. There's no accessible path. The path from the street to where that there was actually an, accept, like an entrance that you could get into was only two feet wide. So I said, okay, let's widen the path. Let's raise the grade. We're going to actually put in a half, hoop, half height basketball hoop for a half court play so that it could be accessible. And the YMCA is already programming it in the Oak Square YMCA in order to have accessible basketball. Um, but one of the things I said is, you know, it's tough. We put in a lower height court or lower height hoop. People are going to hang on it. It's lower, and we don't want people to damage it. So one of the things I said is, it's again, it's about the education. It's about trying to tell people what we're doing. So I had them seal coat into the into the striping, the line, the striping on the court, an accessible basketball logo. And I just said, you know, please put this in there because that people maybe people will respect it more. And we haven't had any problems. We have problems that we have problems in a lot of other parks where people cut down the nets, tear them down when they're higher. We've not had any problem here at all. And so hopefully that's that's helpful. Um, one of the other projects that I've been spending a lot of time working on is the Franklin Park Pathways. Um, it was a project that over for, for a while we were getting maybe $250,000 a year in the capital budget to spend on pathways. And the last two years we've gotten a total of $5 million. So we've been able to do a huge investment in Franklin Park. And what we're doing is we're trying to make not only the pathways more accessible and, and wider, we're making sure every entrance that we path pass by has an accessible entrance because it, they were so much narrower previously. And so when we're resetting stones, we're widening those path with those entrances. Um, all of the benches used to be set back two to three feet off of the pathway width. So now we're bringing those back in, adding in companion seating. Um, there were two picnic groves by, um, by the back entrance of the zoo, and that's what the picture is at the bottom. You can see it, they, they were trying. There's an accessible picnic table but there's no pathway to get to it. And so, you know, it, it's one of those like little steps along the way. So now if you look at the, the, the drawing next to it, you can see there's actually a pathway that's gonna connect all of those. And what's wonderful is the, the one pathway actually is five feet from the accessible parking spaces that are right there at the back end of the zoo. Um, I don't have any after pictures because that's actively under construction right now. Um, so those are just some of the things that we've been doing. Um, when we're hiring our designers, when we put out a new RFQ this year, I said, I want designers to know from day one that we're really pushing this. So I changed a lot of language in our RFQ and I put in very explicitly what we expect. Like not only does this meet ADA, but we want you thinking about it. In their scope of work, we said, we want you to analyze how we can make accessibility upgrades to this park. So not just let's meet ADA with it, let's do something better. And we've actually sp explicitly stated that. So even though we've always asked people for that, we're making it very clear and even the things that we're putting out to the public now, which is great. So, and again, I, th I think that's all I've got, but I just wanted to say thank you guys. And if you guys have any, um, any ideas or anything you guys would like to see in parks to help, we are always happy to hear it. And I'm happy to have people reach out to me. Lauren, can, can I ask a question? Sorry. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I wanna applaud you. This is wonderful and oh, your excitement you. just exudes. And it's it's I'm, so much I'm, fun. Yeah. So um, the question, couple questions I yep. had were related to access. One was about the accessible bathrooms. Are they going to be in close proximity to the area? So we don't have any bathrooms at this facility for Martins Park, mm -hmm. but there are public bathrooms within um, the first floor of the Children's Museum. And that was part of their harbor walk is that they needed to provide restrooms and those are accessible. We don't, in the Parks Department, we have very few bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And the ones that we have are usually in field houses and are only open during sporting events because unfortunately we don't have the staff to man them. Uh -huh. um, but there is a study that we have commissioned to be done, which is a bathroom study for parks citywide. And accessibility is part of that study. But I'm not running that project, so I don't, I don't have an update on that. And uh, the second question was about parking and drop-off areas. Yes, so there's no parking for the park there, but mm -hmm. there is a bus drop-off area, and so that's directly, um, if you actually look at the, the uh, plan on the front, you can see where it says bus drop-off, and so that's somewhere that, um, especially for accessible drop-off, that's gonna be a really fantastic place for people to be able to do that. 
Is, I take that to mean there's already a bus that goes by there? Or? It is. That's where the Children's Museum actually does all of their bus drop-offs. Okay. So when schools come, camps come, that's where their drop-off is currently. So that's where it will continue to be. And one of the things, um, it's, it's a little hard to see in the plan, but there's kind of like a long white line along the, the planting in front that's actually a seat wall. Um, and so that way, when, when school buses get dropped off, it's a place that the teachers can actually have all the kids congregate in one place so they don't go running off, um, which, you know, they, they appreciate. So um, I'm not sure they're going to appreciate walking past a really fun playground on their way to the museum, um, <laughs> but it'll give them a place to come play before they get back on the bus. Sure. Now, what's the, uh, what's the age range for, for the, what's the target age range for, for folks to, to use the park? That's a great question. Um, so the actual play equipment itself is rated between two and 12 years old. So most of the time it's either two to five, five to 12. So there are gonna be some activities that are a little bit more geared towards the younger crowd and a little bit more sure. geared to the older crowd. Um, there is a rope climber. Um, it's a big circular dome. Um, that one's definitely geared towards um, older children. And it was it was interesting. I um, it's, it's not an accessible piece of play equipment and so when I talked to the Richard family about it they said but that was Martin's favorite piece of playground equipment he ever had so that was a uh -huh. direct request from the Richard family um, that that's the one piece of equipment that doesn't really meet that accessibility criteria but I can certainly understand why they wanted it to be there oh sure yeah. um, but in, in terms of that age range that's technically the age range but I know that you know there will be children there will be toddlers out here there will be kids that are 15 16 years old I know um, Martin's older brother, Henry, is very excited about it, and he's seen all of these things, too. Um, so I think, that, I think that we'll have an expanded range here just because of what it is. And also parents are ex would be excited, too. I, I know for me, you know, to be able to, to participate with, with my son or something would be fun, too. So Absolutely, and that's part of what we design for. It's not just children being able to participate, but caregivers who might be in wheelchairs or or have you know walking aids being able to also get up and interact with their kids. So that's a, that's an excellent point. Other questions? I just want to um, thank Lauren very much. We've been involved. She's involved us, uh, my commission, since day one. Really, since the conceptual uh, ideas on the project. And one thing that um, Lauren's really committed to, and my office is the same way, is talking about um, accessibility that goes beyond ADA. Because I think you put it perfectly when you said ADA is a building code. But we want to think about the whole interaction, how people use space, live in space, play in space. And so we describe it as ideal accessibility. And that's what yeah. we shoot for. And to hear that you put all that in your contract language, that's something that I didn't know. But I'll bring that back now to my office. And maybe we could actually um, collaborate on looking at those, Absolutely, that language. Absolutely, that would be great. Well, and that's it's something I've been working on. But the RFQ literally went out three weeks ago, so we just got the responses back in. So that may be why we, we hadn't had a chance to talk about it, because it's that new. That's great. And then one other thing, I'm oh, sorry, just about the Franklin Park mm -hmm. um, bench area. Can you talk a little bit about how that money was allocated with the uh, youth um, oh, yeah. engagement? So, so that's different than the Franklin Park Pathways. So there was another project that I worked on also in Franklin Park, which was the American Legion Playground, which is over off of American Legion back by the back nine of the golf course. Um, it was an existing picnic grove and play area that was, it's one of our most highly permit, like, well, actually it's not, it's not permanent. It's one of our most highly used areas. It's one of the few places that we actually allow grilling. Um, but when this, the mayor first started, I think it was three years ago now, the participatory budget program, which was through the Youth Lead the Change group, um, it was where youth in the city were actually allocated a million dollars of the capital budget for them to decide how we should spend it. So they had what they called change agents, where there were youth that came up with scope for different projects. They met with different people within each um, city department, tried to come up with what they think would be a good way to spend the money. Um, they then put together these scopes, and I think they had like maybe 16 different ones on the ballot, and youth between, I think it was 12 and 25 in the city got to vote. And so they, they, they did the whole process themselves. And this was the first year that they did it, and this playground in American Legion had the highest budget of all the items, and it got the most votes on that ballot. And what the kids said was, we want to renovate this playground and picnic grove, but we want it to be accessible. 
And so I loved the fact that the youth in the city, that was their idea, it was their goal. And so that I happened to be assigned to it, which I loved. Um, and so we actually put in um, pathways that led from the accessible entrance to the park all the way through the picnic grove. It led to the playground. We put in roller tables. We didn't have enough money to renovate the entire play area. So what we did is we took the existing play structure and we actually added accessible elements to it. So that way we could upgrade it. We put in additional new items. We updated the swings, put in um, accessible swings. We also put in one of the dish swings I talked about earlier. Um, we upgraded the picnic tables. So not only did we get nice new ones, but over half of them were then accessible. Again, benches along the pathway. We put in accessible pads next to them, the companion pads. And we also put in, because it's a picnic grove as well as a playground and people use it for a lot of family reunions, we tried to make it multi-generational as well. So we put in um, not only picnic tables, but we also put in game tables that had chess boards on top. Some of those were accessible as well. Um, so it was a fantastic project that really, um, that really brought together um, the youth that did this and they came to all, they came to the meetings, they came to the um, opening. And once we bid the project, some of the things that we hoped to get, what the dish swing was one of them, we couldn't afford because we just wanted so much in there that the bids came in too high. And we actually had a private um, donor, which was the play brigade um, that stepped up and gave us the additional money to get the ad alternates in order to get the dish swing and a few other accessible picnic tables, which was fantastic. I was just so impressed that the youth came up with that on their own and they were yeah. so committed to it. Yeah, it was, yeah, really it was fantastic. I have a question just around Martin's yeah. Park. The signage that you said describes some of the plants and other things there, are they going to be audio described as well or just all print text? Right now I think they're print text, but I think that's something that we could, that I think we should look at. Yeah. Great, thanks. Absolutely. And also just on that point that you thought it was fantastic that the youth um, came up with that project. Mm -hmm. This past year's youth participatory budget, we actually, the Parks Department was given $500,000 to do accessibility upgrades in the park from the Youth Lead the Change. Wow. And so all of us kind of said, ooh, we, you know, we didn't think we could afford this, but we'd like to do this. And so it was allocated throughout all, a, a lot of projects. So that was another thing that the youth did, which is pretty fantastic. Excellent. Have you, have you reached out to youth with disabilities to invite them to maybe a opening or I haven't but I honestly I didn't realize that that organization existed but I'm going to partners now partners with disability okay partners with youth partners with yeah youth PYD yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that you would should. be fantastic would absolutely be, yeah absolutely awesome any additional questions from board members no. great thank you guys Lauren again. thank you so much your energy is What's that? Oh. Awesome. Thank you, Lauren. So up next we have, and we'll, um, at the end of the meeting, we usually set aside time for questions from the public. So we will grab those at the end. So next up we have uh, Jasmine from the Ruderman Foundation, who is here to talk about their upcoming conference. Yes. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so as you said, my name is Jasmine Godhelf. Um, I work at the Ruderman Family Foundation. Um, and actually, I think that you and I know each other from Temple Israel. That's correct. Uh, yeah, I was right. a sixth grade teacher in their Sunday school last year. Um, and um, I, I'd love to tell you a little bit about the foundation and mostly about this conference that we're putting on in November, um, which is a two-day conference that's happening very close to Martins Park uh, in the Seaport. So the foundation, the Ruderman Family Foundation, is a philanthropic foundation that is, was um, established and is currently run day to day by the Ruderman family. Um, we are a global foundation. We have three offices, one in Boston, one in New York, uh, and one in, in uh, near Tel Aviv in Israel. Um, most of our work, about $10 million a year, goes to a strategic focus on inclusion. Uh, our work on inclusion is cross-disability, it's cross-sector, and it spans the lifetime of a person. And so we really focus on education, on employment, on healthcare, on faith initiatives, um, and many, many more that I'm happy to talk about and I'm happy to answer questions on if you'd like later. Um, our work, we focus a lot on programming and then 
a little bit out of the ordinary for a family foundation, we also do a lot of advocacy. So we are out there on social media. Um, we are calling people out for behavior we feel is uh, discriminatory. Um, and in addition, we're putting out research papers. So we put out, uh, we're calling them Ruderman white papers about timely issues. So um, I would say that the biggest one, the one that's had the biggest impact is about interactions between law enforcement, law enforcement use of force, and people with disabilities, um, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you is, is a big story. And our, our paper really focused on the fact that it's a big story that's not being discussed. Um, in addition to that, we've put out material, uh, put out a research paper about representation in Hollywood, and that's something where we are active. Um, you know, 95% of characters with disabilities are played by actors that don't have disabilities, and that is a problem, and it's part of Hollywood's diversity problem, um, and it's not being addressed. So, um, we do all of that, and then every two years, we put together a conference that we call the Ruderman Inclusion Summit. It's a two-day conference. Um, we're trying this year to gather 1,000 people. It's happening, as I said, at the Seaport, the Seaport Hotel and World Trade Center. Um, and like our work, it is cross-disability and cross-sector. So. That means that our agenda really focuses on the different, uh, on different uh, fields. So we're going to be talking about education, as like I said before, employment, housing, um, the topics of our white paper. So we do have a session on law enforcement. We have a couple of activists um, as well as the Boston Police Commissioner, um, who's agreed to be on the panel, and some journalists. It's going to be. Very exciting, in my opinion, and very, very interesting. Um, in addition to that, we are, also, as I said, going to be talking about Hollywood. We're going to be talking about voting accessibility. Um, and we're going to be talking about uh, sports, interfaith work. So it's an interfaith panel about inclusion in faith work. Um, and also, a topic that's really important to me is the next generation and the leadership of youth with disabilities. In terms of our focus, in terms of an audience focus, um, I would say that youth and sort of the next generation is something we're putting a lot of effort into. So most of our, most of the audience will be people who work in, um, you know, in inclusion organizations, disability organizations, educators, social workers, lawyers, um, therapists, the professionals. In addition to that, a lot, we're really trying to get a lot of activists. We're, our goal um, during the planning process is to make the summit as accessible as possible, as welcoming and friendly, as inclusive as possible, because if it wasn't, then what are we doing here? Um, and um, it's, in addition to that, the, the topic of youth and getting people who are emerging leaders or helping them uh, become the, the leaders, the next generation of um, leaders in nonprofits, in business, in consulting. We are putting a lot of effort into that as an organization. And at the summit itself, we're also putting a lot of effort into that. So we're going to be running pre-conference workshops for activists and um, new leaders, emerging leaders, and students about um, skills for advocacy, as well as how to focus their efforts in their own communities. Uh, that's all part of our Link 20 network, which is a network for youth. Um, and like, I keep saying youth, but I mean that in the, def the sort of the UN definition, right? So young professionals and students. Um, in addition to that, alongside the summit, we'll be summit will be running a hackathon. Uh, where we'll be connecting people uh, with everyday challenges, with engineers, designers, um, and artists to come together and within a two-day period, a very high-pressure uh, environment, within a two-day period, they're going to be having to come up with a solution for whatever that problem is, that challenge, and to prototype it. And at the end, we'll pick a couple winners. Uh, 
All of this is to tell you about this conference, which I'm very, very excited about, um, and is happening here in Boston. And I'm here talking to you about it, um, mostly to spread the word. Uh, the networks that I'm looking at right now are huge. Each of you is um, you know, a key, a, a pathway into huge networks around town. And I just feel so lucky that I get to talk to you about it, to tell you about it, answer your questions, um, and have you there, hopefully. Uh, we're really proud to hold the summit in Boston. And we look forward to having a strong showing. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Jasmine, I, uh, this is Ari, and uh, I was uh, very fortunate to attend the summit two years ago. Oh, yeah? And it was lovely, and it was, uh, I had so many good interactions uh, with people and just with the organizers organizing it, and it was very accessible. Great. So I want to give that feedback. The other feedback I want to give is that Ruderman family has worked a lot with Mass General, I work at Mass General, and uh, they've done a lot of support in kind of heightening awareness and advocacy in that area. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is, I know you're looking at several different areas, education, um, as far as healthcare goes, who is being invited and what is being discussed? Great question. Um, so our focus on healthcare is really about, our panel will be about innovation um, in healthcare. So we see there's going to be some people talking about policies and then some people talking about innovation on the practical level. And so we have Sarah Hart Weir, who is the, um, she's the executive director of the National Down Syndrome Society. In addition, we're going to have um, two people from Mass General. Um, Dr. Brian Scottco oh, and Debbie Burke. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition to that, oh, there's someone else. Oh, Dr. Susan Parrish from Northeastern University. Um, and so it's a bit, of, a bit of a mix, some academia, some mm -hmm. policy work. She, um, National Down Syndrome Society, they're based in Washington and they're very much about politics. Yes. And then some of that practical um, everyday work from the two people from Mass General. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. It's Felicia Birdsong. Um, you mentioned the, uh, like a think tank where they would do the prototypes, they would present a problem. Mm -hmm. the Can you speak a little more about that? Yeah, sure. So um, the idea is, are you guys familiar with a hackathon? Um, okay, so a hackathon is based on this idea of a lot of uh, people coming together with, thank you, um, a lot of people coming together around a central theme or a central challenge and coming within a very limited amount of time tasked with solving that problem, that challenge, coming up with a solution. In this case, in our case, what it is is we are going to be um, finding people with different challenges, people with disabilities who have some everyday challenge that they're dealing with, and we are going to be uh, putting them on a team with volunteer participants from you know, engineers, designers, biomed, biotech, um, as well as with mentors who are already you know, very successful in the field, either in academia or in business, um, and tasking them with solving that challenge within two days. Mm -hmm. um, it's very exciting. And it's going to be happening at the seaport alongside the summit. And the idea is to have that going on and for people to really see that working. We're hopefully, we're working on getting 3D printers there. Um, you know, there's the other sort of easier materials to get in order to get people to prototype it, whether they're software engineers or other types of designers, artists, engineers, um, to come together and, and come up with something new. And the idea is that it, it's this like burst of creativity with a, a lot of pressure. Um, and at the end, we hope to present the, the various prototypes that the teams come up with. Interesting. Yeah. I have one other question. Um, I was looking, this doesn't say on, the, on this sheet, but is there a registration fee? Yes. Okay. Um, great question. There is a registration fee. The general attendance fee is $175. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then there is a fee for students or people with disabilities um, who need a discount. There's a discounted fee of $50. Um, yeah. And it's and that's um, they're they're the exact same. It's the same ticket. Uh, it's the exact same access for the whole time and the meals and everything. And the, there's going to be a party on the Sunday night, so it'll be really fun. Martin and Madden will be there. Sorry. Martin and Madden will be there. Martin who? Marley Madden. Oh, Mar oh, Marley Madden will be there. I didn't talk about. Yeah, that's a big one. I didn't talk about our yeah. keynote speakers. Marley Madden, the actress, the uh, will be speaking. Um, the former president of Malawi, Joyce, Dr. Joyce Banda, who is um, her focus when she was president of Malawi uh, was women and girls, and a lot of her work around inclusion is inclusion for women and girls. Um, and then we're also going to be having a congressional panel that will be moderated by Judy Woodruff from PBS NewsHour. Um, right now we have one Congress member lined up, and that's Congressman Jim Langevin from Rhode Island. And we're, we're working actually on getting a Republican as well. Um, but uh, a lot of these people's <laughs> schedules are booked up. Great. Any other questions? Excellent. I, like, uh, I also attended two years ago and, oh, and echo the thoughts around the inclusion and the accessibility piece. So thank you for that. Yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing the information. And we will be certain to uh, Thanks, spread it. Spread the awareness among our networks as well. Wonderful. So Thank good, you so much. Good luck in the final planning stages. All right. Be there. They'll see you there. My yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I'm gonna live there. Hey. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So on to the commissioner's report. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, first of all, I'd like to let everybody know that we have a new staff person who just joined our office two weeks ago. His name is Winston Pierre. And he's here today, so I'd like to invite him up to introduce himself, talk a little bit about his background and what he hopes to do with the commission. Welcome, Winston. Welcome. 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 Thank you very much. My name is Winston Pierre, and this is my third week serving as a constituent and engagement specialist. I am very excited um, to be a part of this team and also to be at the service of this new community. Part of my job will be to um, implement strategies to reach diverse audience and also to make sure that our services extended to people who has not yet benefit from our services. I'm excited by the opportunity to do so. And when I wake up every day, I feel blessed. I feel fortunate because I know the work that I do and the commitment of the commissions to the people to people with disability is something that is very important. And I look forward to working with each and every single of you on what we can do to engage more in diverse residents and also what we can do to ensure we create access and opportunity to all people with disability within the city of Boston. Thank you. Welcome. 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 Thank you. Welcome. Well, yeah. Winston's only been here a few weeks, but he's been doing a great job so far. Uh, he has a background at MCDHH. He worked there for um, a period of time. And he also speaks um, two other languages. So we have some diversity in the office as far as communication. So we're really excited about that. And we hope moving forward that Winston will get involved with all the board members and work together to get information out to your communities. So. Um, one thing that Winston is working on is a big project that has come out of our office this summer. It's the Accessibility Priority Survey, and this is a survey that we developed over the summer. We had a Harvard Rappaport <laughs> Fellow mm -hmm. who worked on the survey, and basically it's, um, it's about a five-page survey, and it looks at all the issues in Boston, which could be barriers for people um, living, working, and visiting Boston. And we've broken the survey down into three sections. The first section is on things that we control directly, things like city hall access, access to voting, um, access to taxi cabs, things that we can directly influence through policy and service. The second section is on things that we work with peripherally, like the MBTA, um, other organizations to, to control things in Boston, like development, sidewalks, things like that. that we don't always control, but um, we can work with to improve things. And the third area is things that we have really no control over, but we'd like to help with. Things like Uber, mm. businesses, um, 
you know, sometimes we had complaints about service animals not being allowed in businesses, things like that. So those are the things that we want to get information on so we can develop a strategic plan and move forward working on the priorities that people want us to focus on. So Winston has begun working on that, doing outreach through email. He's um, attending different outreach events in the city and bringing the survey with him. He'll be at the Abilities Expo in two weeks doing the survey and engaging people. So we have emailed the survey out. Has everybody seen it? Has everybody got a link? Okay. So we would love to ask you to forward it to your networks. Um, we won't share any ident identifying information if people want to take it anonymously. We would just love to get everybody's feedback on it. Um, another project that we're working on is um, we do all the accessible parking in the city. So last week we had a city council hearing to talk about the issue of parking for caregivers in the city. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have family members or um, visiting nurses or people from agencies who help with personal care <coughs> activities of daily living that allows people with disabilities to live in the community rather than go into a nursing home or a, um, a facility. So caretakers can run into difficulty in areas that have resident parking mm -hmm. because if they come in from out of town or their family members who don't live in Boston, they may not be able to park. Mm -hmm. So we decided to form a working group to look at this issue to see what we can do to help support uh, caregivers and family members because sometimes it can be the difference really of people living in the community or being forced uh, into a facility. Mm -hmm. So we welcome ideas on that if people have any and I'll keep you updated as we move forward with the working group. Um, one other thing that I've been working on is working with the MBTA on their pilot non-ADA paratransit program. You may all know that last year they started a program where people can take taxi cabs, people who are on the ride can take taxi cabs instead of ride vehicles. So now they're expanding that to use taxi cabs that have wheelchair access. So people who use wheelchairs can also participate in the program to choose those instead of a ride vehicle. So it offers a lot more benefit because you don't have to share the vehicle with anyone. You can do same day trips. You can um, call at the last minute. So we're hoping to work with the city's WAVE program. WAVE stands for Wheelchair Accessible Vehicles. It's the accessible taxis. So we're working with um, them to move this um, program forward. Excuse me, Commissioner. I have yes. a question. You said, is that already in existence with the ride? The, the Uber and taxi cab is in existence, but currently they don't have any wheelchair accessible vehicles. Okay. So this will add that component to it. Okay, okay, interesting. Um, Chris, I yes. have a question regarding that. What about Lyft services? Are they able to? Lyft is also part of it, yep. Yeah. It's Uber, Lyft, and taxis. And the, the MBTA has information on their website, too, if you're interested. And then um, some events I just want to mention that are coming up. We have the Abilities Expo, September 8th, 9th, and 10th. Is that right, Winston? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's at the Boston Convention and Exposition Center. We'll have a table there. We welcome everybody to come by and visit us. It's a free event. Welcome to open to all people with disabilities. And then we also have our Civic Engagement Day. This will be our second annual event where we bring people into City Hall to see the updates that we've been doing in the building. I know Patricia is going to talk about some of those, but the noise you've been hearing in the background is the work on the City Council Chamber, which is scheduled to open in a month or so. So um, people can try out voting, the accessible voting machine called the AutoMark. They can meet their city councilors, um, find out where they vote, um, talk about issues in the neighborhoods. So we have a tentative date of Friday, September 22nd, but I'll confirm that um, later in the week. And one other thing to mention, um, over the summer, we had a meeting about disability history to look at putting together a working group to do something, uh, maybe a walking tour in Boston or an audio tour to look at the different institutions that used to be in Boston. I know the Perkins School for the Blind started in my neighborhood. There used to be things like insane asylums, and mm -hmm. uh, in my neighborhood there was also a home for idiotic youth. So we've come a long way, but it's really important to remember our history so that we can um, move forward and hopefully never go back to that. And especially like Jasmine mentioned earlier, we don't want to, um, we want the younger generation to remember that it wasn't always so easy to get access. People weren't always so inviting and the world wasn't always so inclusive. So we want to make sure that everybody knows about the history of people with disabilities and 
we um, use that as a springboard to make greater access as we move forward. So that's all I have. Does anyone have questions? I have a question just regarding the survey. Is there a target number of surveys to be completed? We're hoping to get 500, but we'll have it open for a little while, so. That's great. It's been open for a, for a little bit, correct? Um, we opened it on ADA day, so almost a month. Mm. Any, uh, how many people have participated so far? We have around 100. That's great. So, yep, it's getting there. It seems like Winston was busy today sending out emails. I got about four or five of them forwarded to me. So uh, nice, nice work reaching out to different folks in the community. So That's great to hear. That's yeah. Um, and welcome again. Excellent. All right. We are on to the architectural access update with Patricia. Hello, everyone. My name is Patricia Mendez. I'm the architectural access specialist. Um, I would like to talk about uh, a few exciting projects that we've been working on. The first one is about a national grid. They're planning to install this huge underground vault that they have a metal cover. So we've been working with them to develop a redesign that is better than the current one. The current one is this smooth metal material for the lid of the sidewalk um, surface. So we've been working and asking them to develop a material that is closer to the texture of the concrete, standard concrete sidewalk, and they came up with this second, I'm going to pass out the sample, that has a better grit, a rougher texture. So we're very excited about this. I'm gonna pass it. And these are usually in the path of travel on the sidewalk, is that right, Patricia? Yes. Patricia, these are usually in the path of travel. Yes, they are on on the sidewalk, and they're big, so they take a big part of the accessible path. So we weren't super happy about approving them, but since they've improved their design and they're going to change this for a future installation, it's going to take about a year to implement, but that's going to be the, the new surface for um, vault covers on sidewalks for National Grid. And so I guess, I'm maybe I'm missing the logic, the difference. I know the texture is different, but you can still feel the whatever the bumps are on it. The bumps? Yeah. Yes, our so concern for accessibility was the, the fact that as soon as that metal gets moist mm -hmm. with water or rain or ice, it's it, it gets really slippery gotcha. and treacherous. Um, so that rough material, uh, really enhances the. But the bumps are smoother on this one. Aren't they less high on this than the previous ones? Mm -hmm. The height of the bumps, they're about the same. They're about the same. But it's the just same. Uh, a rougher texture. Patricia, yes. now is this for one specific project? You said there was, <coughs> you said that there was a big underground project going on, or, or is this for all na uh, national grid projects going forward? for all uh, national grid covers going forward in the city of Boston. That's great. Well, and Patricia it's so good, it'll probably take it outside Boston in the future too. <laughs> Patricia, I've got a question. Um, this is the new one the, with the rough, rougher feeling, but the grooves on this have been scratched away. So it's the grooves that I'm feeling right now are actually smooth like this. So is this gonna wear out eventually? Um, when, when they wear out, they're gonna have to re replace the entire assembly. How old is this one? That's brand new. Because it's, it's, it's already, <laughs> it's already it's not wearing down. Yet. So I'm like, hmm. So we'll yeah. see. I th we think it's an improvement. Mm. Yeah. We'll see. Um, here's just, yeah, I'm sorry, just a quick, you probably already mentioned it. Uh, which one do we have right now? Uh, the metal one or? The metal one. The metal one, okay. So we're switching to the other. They're both yeah. metal. Okay. The, the, one, the one that has a texture like sandpaper is the future one. Okay. Um, the next project that I want to talk about that I'm very excited, it's um, the Fenway Center. This is a large development. 
is two residential towers on Beacon Street. And in the back, the back street is David Ortiz Way. This is in the Fenway area. So this is a large development, again, that connects two MBTA stations, one of the Green Line, um, Fen Fenway Station? Probably. Fenway Station, mm -hmm. yes. The other yeah. one is a commuter, commuter MBTA stop. So the exciting part is that this development has two levels, and there, the street that connects is very steep, Maitland Street connects the lower level, the Ortiz, to the upper, higher level, Beacon Street. So there's going to be a public plaza connecting the two towers and the stations, and there's going to be a public elevator connecting all the levels from the plaza to the to both of street levels and the parking, which is underground. Um, and we're very grateful to the um, developing team that agreed to uh, plan for this public 24-7 elevator right next to the stair uh, for the plaza. So it's going to be a, is it going to be a housing de development uh, on there or? It's the going towers? to be two residential towers. One is going to be four stories, the other one seven stories. There's going to be one level of commercial space and two levels of underground parking. Is this John Rosenthal's project? Um, I'm not sure who, who that is, but I can get back to you. It's the Air Rights project, right? Like going over part of one of the MBTA lines that they're going to deck over. This is um, near Beacon Street. Part of it, I think, is the air rights over, over the uh, Mass Pike, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Beacon Street and David Ortiz Way. Okay. Next is the North Washington Street Bridge. This is a major uh, replacement. This is a city of Boston project in partnership with MassDOT and the Federal Highway Administ Administration that are replacing the entire Charlestown Bridge. And this is the, the bridge right next to the Zakem Bridge that connects Charlestown with the North End. This project is going to last about uh, five years. And again, we're very excited about it because it's going to provide pedestrian facilities uh, it's going to have a complete street feel to it, uh, road construction. It's going to have bike paths separated from the traffic, and it, the bike paths are also going to be separated from the pedestrian path. It's going to have part of the Freedom Trail, and again, it's going to have nice lighting and trees and benches, and it's going to be beautiful. When's the current bridge going to be taken down? Um, this project is starting at the end of this year, of uh, 2017, so it's going to be soon. So it's going to probably be a mess over there while they're tearing it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's going to be involved, yes. Especially with the new housing development that mm -hmm. that's right going to be a bridge, yeah. you know, occupied right there too. So. It's going to be an issue. Um, the next project I want to talk about uh, briefly is the Symphony Hall MBTA station. This is the Green Line, and it, it's a, a station okay. that currently is not accessible. So uh, the accessibility upgrade is going to be addition of four new elevators and uh, emergency egress, as well as restrooms. Symphony Hall. Okay. This project is in the early design, 25% design. The other exciting announcement is about the new hearing loops installed in City Hall. There's three new uh, hearing loops installed. One of them is in this room 
900. The other one is room 801, which is also used for large meetings and hearings. And the other one is the Piedmonte uh, room. And as uh, Commissioner mentioned, the Ionella, Ionella Chamber is on track to be finished this fall. That's it for me. Great. Any questions for Patricia? No. Great. Will there be any sort of uh, opening or like ribbon cutting for the city council chambers? I don't have that information yet, but I can follow up if I know. We would hope to be able to, to unveil it at the Civic Engagement Day. Mm. We'll see how the schedule lines up for that. But I do just want to give Patricia credit for the change at the National Grid vaults because that was something that she initiated and National Grid was really willing to change their whole uh, system of upgrading it to the much less slippery uh, material. So we'll see that uh, implemented through the whole city. So that's going to be a big improvement in pedestrian access. And I think it benefits everybody. It does. Yeah. So, so, that's so congratulations to Patricia for that. Thanks, Thanks Thank for you your Patricia. advocacy efforts. Patricia. Well done. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for the informational report. Uh, any old business? Uh, thank you, Kyle. I think this falls under both old items and old action items. Um, but just an update on the two letters that the board voted on last uh, month. The Both are scheduled to be mailed out this week, um, pending approval through our intergovernmental office. That was the letter um, against physician-assisted suicide and a letter, um, that was a letter against that, and then a letter of support for a house bill related to architectural access that Patricia uh, presented on last month. So those letters are both scheduled to be put out um, into the mail to the respective parties next uh, this week. And I believe that's it. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, old action items in addition to the one Jessica just presented? No. All right. New business. Any new business? Hearing none. New action items. None. Excellent. Welcome to the summer, folks. <laughs> All right. So we want to um, so public input. Anyone from the public like to share comments or have questions? If you do, we just ask that you uh, use the podium so it's mic'd and you're on camera. And if uh, you can introduce yourself as well, that would be great. Please. Sure. Thank. Thank you, uh, Jack Peacock from Worcester. Uh, question on the new surface material for the national grid um, usually when I do uh, painting or whatever I rough up the surface so I have better adhesion so is this going to be a problem in the winter time with the icing is, or are they going to put some brine to pretreat the tops so that they don't collect and, and ice up do you know Patricia yeah we had the same question the the um, Vault covers are designed to have some drainage, so hopefully they won't accumulate uh, water. Excellent. Thank you for coming all the way from Worcester to ask that question. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. much, much, much appreciated. Uh, any other comments from the public? All right, so then we will adjourn and the next meeting of the City of Boston Commission for Persons with Disabilities will be on Monday, September 25th, 5.30 p.m. in this room. Thank you all and enjoy the last month or so of summer. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Good job. Thanks. See you in two weeks.